The nation that approaches its God in the cult of the religion of art is the ethical nation that knows its state and the actions of the state to be the will and the achievement of its own self. This spirit confronting the self-conscious nation is therefore not the divine light, which being devoid of a self does not contain within it the self-certainty of the individuals, but is only their universal essence and the lordly power in which they disappear. The cult of the religion of this simple amorphous essence gives back to its votaries, therefore, in general, merely this that they are the people of their God who secures for them not only their enduring existence and their substance as such, not, however, their actual self, which on the contrary is rejected. For they reverence their God as the empty depth, not as spirit. But the cult of the religion of art, on the other hand, is without that abstract simplicity of the essence and therefore of its depth. That essence, however, which is immediately united with the self is in itself spirit and the truth that is a knowing, though still not the truth that is known or the truth that knows itself in the depths of its nature. Because then the essence here contains a self, its manifestation is well disposed towards consciousness. And in the cult, Consciousness receives not only the general sanction of its enduring existence, but also its conscious existence in the cult itself, just as, conversely, the essence does not have an actuality devoid of self in a rejected people whose substance merely is acknowledged, but in the people whose self is acknowledged in its substance. Paragraph 720 is leading us into a new subsection of the religion portion of the work. This is the living work of art by contrast to the previous subsection, which is the abstract work of art. So we're going to want to see some differentiation between them. What we're going to see in this paragraph, however, is actually a contrast between what's going on in this section of religion, religion in the form of art, and the previous section, which had to do with natural religion, right? And a particular form that Hegel seems to view as maybe most advanced before we get to the, uh, the, the, the person who's fabricating images. Um, we're looking at a stance of the, you know, religion as a religion of light, the divine light, the Lord, uh, which we could identify to some degree with Hegel's picture, not the reality, of course, but his picture of Zoroastrianism. And what we're seeing here in this section is a development towards something that should be more lebendiga, lively, living, uh, in terms of what the object of religion actually is. And we've already seen in the previous paragraphs this cult, the, the locus of worship, the sets of rituals, beliefs uh, of the what he's calling the ethical nation, as a place in which mediation is taking place and a place in which the God can be encountered, being developed. We're going to see that much more in this section. And then we're going to be leading into the third and final subsection of this religion in the form of art, looking at language once again. So in this paragraph, what we really have is a big contrast being developed, and it's important in part not just because there's a dialectical development, but because we're getting to see what kind of progress is taking place, at least within the communities that Hegel is willing to identify as you know, the ethical nation. Now, a bit of a side note, this is the uh, Greek city-state. Right? So if you think about Hegel's own particular 
vision of history, this would no longer be the city-state by the time that we have you know, the earlier sections, stoicism, skepticism, unhappy consciousness arising on the scene. If you look at Hegel's philosophy of history, you know, once the Greek city-state has been subsumed into the Macedonian Empire, it, it's kind of over as far as like the development of spirit within Greece, other than, you know, Athens being a place for philosophy. And then, you know, things are going to shift to the, to the Roman side. But I don't think that we need to be necessarily chained or beholden to Hegel's own views upon this. And we could perhaps, you know, read in his religion of the ethical nation into many other of the world religions and you know particularized religions that we could encounter if we were you know doing good comparative work. All right, so all that said, let's let's look at the actual contrast. He begins by saying, the nation, the folk that approaches its God in the cult of the religion of art is the ethical Zitlikis nation that knows its state and the actions of the state to be the will and the achievement of its own self. So we, we have two things being connected here. We have the shtat, the state, right, the governing body, and then we have the people, the nation, the folk, and through religion. Now, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. You might say, well, wait a second, you know, the the Greek city-states were not theocracies. So how does this fit in? Well, you know, they weren't theocracies as such where the religious rulers are dominating everything, but the religion was an integral part of the state and there's a, a back and forth thing and the people are also involved there. And what does he mean by an ethical nation? We should remind ourselves of this. It doesn't mean that everybody's ethically pure and wonderful or anything like that. Zitlichis is uh, being contrasted to, say, moralicious, you know, the moral nation that has a bunch of rules and, and you know, has worked things out rationally. Zitlichis goes back to the zitta, the, you can say mores, right, in Latin, or the uh, ethe, the customs, the habits, the traditions, um, and the differentiation that takes place within the community by, by which people are assigned their roles and either fulfill them or don't fulfill them. And there's a lot of back and forth within any real ethical nation where there's some criticism going on and some innovation and a lot of discussion and there can be controversies, right? So this is a lively state, you could say. And we're going to be contrasting this. So this nation uh, knows its state and the actions of the state to be the will and achievement of its own self. That's really central for Hegel in this, this knowing uh, on the one hand and this appropriation, the fact that what is happening in this is no longer just pushed off to the gods. We're not just the playthings of the gods. We are agents. We are engaging, you might say, even cooperating with or implementing the will of the gods. We are commuting with them, as we saw in the previous section. So he goes on and he says, this spirit confronting, now notice what else he says, the self-conscious nation. Now it's no longer self-consciousness as the self-consciousness of the individual. The nation itself is conscious of itself. And we could say that this is happening in part through its religious commitments and rituals. It's also happening through language. The language is the medium of self-consciousness, not only for individuals, but even more so for communities. So even though language isn't being talked about here, it's playing in a, a really important role. So he says, the spirit confronting the self-conscious nation is not therefore the divine light which being devoid of a self does not contain within it the self-certainty of the individuals. So there's something that was missing in this previous shape of religion. Remember too that going back to the very beginning of the religion section, Hegel has set 
one of the tasks for religion, that of reconciling or uniting or bringing together consciousness and self-consciousness, and that is part of how religion is spirit. So we had a less developed, a not completely adequate, actually in many respects inadequate, shape of religion earlier on with this religion of the divine light, and one aspect is that it is devoid of a self. What's devoid of a self? Are the individuals devoid of a self? No, they have a self, but it's not a self that is united with the divine self, right? Instead of being a self, it's something like a force. It's something like a thought or something like the physical manifestation in terms of light, say the light of the sun or the light of the fire. So he says a little bit more. It's only their universal essence, the um, Algemeines Wesen, right? And here, you, you know, would it be appropriate to translate Wesen as being? Essence actually works better. It's their essence, but it's an essence that's lacking Wirklichkeit or Dasein, uh, actuality or existence. It is universal. It's not universal in the sense of the concrete universal that unites these individuals together. It's something they can look to, and it might it might actually provide them with a lot of, you know, robust, uh, interesting stories and images and narratives and things like that. But it's not something where they can find themselves. They're being invited, in some respect, to lose themselves in this. Right. So it doesn't contain the self certainty of the individuals, only their universal essence. And then he says, the lordly power, the herrische macht, right? So there's something of worshiping that which shows itself to be powerful. It makes sense with light, right? And the sun uh, helps makes things grow. I mean, even think about Plato in the Republic, uh, book seven, actually book six as well, What's the one thing that he centers on to be the analog in the physical, visible world to the form of the good? The sun, right? So there's, there's something to this, but there's something missing as well. Now, it's interesting. Um, the translation here, <coughs> votaries, right? It's a rather rich term. Those who make commitments, those who make vows, um, uh, the angehörigen, right? The, those who are hearing and obeying, those who are committed to this, this divine light, this God that they're worshiping. What are they? They're, they're the people of the God. They assume a type of identity and identification by virtue of being involved in something that is a cult, something that there, there is a, a worship going on. There is something intergenerational. There is something meaningful Right? He says, the cult of the religion of this simple amorphous essence gives back to its votaries. It gives them something, in general, merely this. They are the people of their God who secures for them what? Who gives them what in return? Their enduring existence, their bestehen. Now, this is a, a term that Hegel's going to use on both sides. He's used previously. Bestehen is not the same thing as sein, Wesen, Dasein. It's, it's yet another sort of modality, right? And he says there's substance as such. Substanz uh, überhaupt, right? Altsok. And so they're getting something, but it's not something that is really what they could have. And they may not even suspect that this is missing until they see a, a further development, a further stage. He says as well, this is not their actual self, which on the contrary is rejected. So the, the, the votaries, the worshipers, the cult members, they do have an actual self as individual human beings, but that is verworfen, thrown aside, cast away. It's not being part of the relation with the God. By contrast, what do we have on the other side? The cult of the religion of art, of the ethical nation. He says that it is without that abstract simplicity of the essence and therefore of that depth, right? Why is he talking about depth here? Well, because 
those who are involved in the cult of the religion of the divine light are worshiping something. They are relating to something, something that is, you know, essential, something that matters, something that is, we don't want to say real, but has real effects, but it's empty depth, something that you can recede into, proceed into follow out, but you're not going to find anything there. It's not spirit. There, there, what's lacking is this interconnection of things, this interaction that would be there in the cult of the religion of art. So he goes on and he says, what we're losing here is the abstract simplicity of the essence and its depth, but that essence, which is immediately united with the self. That essence is, is the God, right? The essence is immediately, on uh, right? Uh, united with the self is in itself spirit. So spirit is on this side. And he says, a truth that is knowing. A truth that is not just known, but which itself is knowing, that has agency, that has mind to it that can enter into relation with the worshipers it says though still not the truth that is known or the truth that knows itself and the depth of its nature there's still something to be developed here so then he says because the essence here contains a self its manifestation is well disposed towards consciousness consciousness is the worshiper, what would be the votaries on this side, has now become the conscious worshiper, uh, the member of the cult, the participant in the cult. And he says, um, in the cult, consciousness receives not only, as he calls it, the general sanction of its enduring existence. So again, we have this bestehen here, right? Uh, the general sanction, allgemeinige Berechtigung. Um, uh, consciousness is getting that through the cult in its relation to the, the God, in its engagement with it. Um, but there's more here, right? He says that it not only receives that, but it's conscious existence in the cult itself. So that's very interesting. Conscious existence, and now actually the way that the German is phrased is, in, in the cult it receives not only this, but also this. So conscious existence. In ihm selbst bewusstes Dasein, existence that has become conscious of itself in relation to things, as, as Dasein. And he goes on and he says, um, just as conversely the essence does not have an actuality devoid of self, a Wirklichkeit that is, is lacking self, in a rejected people whose substance is merely acknowledged, but in the people whose self is acknowledged, Aner Kant, right? Aner Kennen is what's at, at play here in the substance. So the people has a substance in either side, but it's a question of whether it also has a self with all that goes along with self, agency, contingency, communication back and forth, taking positions on oneself, the richness that is ethical life within the nation. Recognition is, is possible here, not over here. You're not going to get recognition as who you are from the God who is merely empty depth, whereas you will get it within the religion of art of the ethical nation. Self-consciousness then comes forth from the cult satisfied in its essence and the God enters into it as into its habitation. This habitation is by itself the night of substance or its pure individuality, but no longer the tense individuality of the artist, an individuality which has not yet reconciled itself with its essence that is in process of becoming objective. It is the satisfied night of substance, which has its pathos within itself. And it is not in need of anything because it returns from intuition, from the objectivity that has been superseded. 
This pathos is by itself the being of the risen sun, but a being which has now set within itself and has its setting or going down, that is self-consciousness and hence existence and actuality within itself. It has here traversed the movement of its actualization, coming down from its pure essential nature and becoming an objective force of nature and the expressions of that force, it is an outer existence for the other, for the self by which it is consumed. The silent essence of selfless nature in its fruits attains to that stage where self-prepared and digested, it offers itself to life that has a self-like nature. In its usefulness as food and drink, it reaches its highest perfection. For in this, it is the possibility of a higher existence and comes into contact with spiritual reality. In its metamorphosis, the earth spirit has developed partly into a silently energizing substance, partly into a spiritual fermentation. In the first case, it is the feminine principle of nourishment. In the other, the masculine principle, the self-impelling force of self-conscious existence. Paragraph 721 is a, a rather rich one in its suggestiveness, in, in what Hegel is describing here, but I think that it can be very confusing as well to figure out exactly what's happening on what side and in relation to whom. And it, and it concludes with something a little bit weird, this, you know, masculine and feminine principles of things. We'll get to that in just a moment, but we do want to keep in mind where it is heading by the end of this paragraph, he's going to talk about how the God or the essence is becoming an objective force of nature, a natura craft, which is offering itself to not just the individual, but individuals within the cultus, the, the religious community, that of the ethical nation. And this is something that you would think, well, this could apply to not just you know the ethical nation or the Greek city-state, but to all sorts of other um, religions as well, because we see that grain and wine, or pick whatever else you want, whatever you know fermented thing there is, deities abound throughout pretty much most mythologies, most religious systems. If they have something that they do ferment, if they have something that they do harvest there's usually going to be at least some space for that within the religious system. So we'll, we'll need to think about that a little bit more. But let's see where he starts. He says, self-consciousness comes forth from the cult satisfied in its essence. This satisfaction is going to be an important factor. It already was in the past, but it's going to be more and more important as this section goes on. And he says, and the God enters into it, into what? Into the cult, into self-consciousness, um, into something like, now here Miller translates it as habitation. Uh, Stete could also be site. So the worshiper or the worshipers together, the God enters into not just communication with them, but genuine communion with them. And we've seen uh, some discussion of habitation of the God earlier, but that was vonung. That was, you know, within the temple. Now this is within the framework of the interaction of the cult. And so he says this habitation, now this is what we're going to be unpacking through the rest of the uh, paragraph. The habitation is by itself the night of substance or it's, pure individuality. Now here's an interesting contrast, but no longer the tense individuality of the artist, an individuality in which there is tension, the tension between the artist, the, the you know, whether understood as the Kunstler or the, uh, uh, the Meister, the one who manipulates the materials to try to create something that is adequate to the divine that's being depicted for the divine as a, a medium for the divine, right? This individuality is now, the artist was no longer, was not reconciled itself with the essence that is in process of becoming objective. 
Um, and, and the artist is indeed part of the process of making the divine objective, gegenständlich, something that we can actually look at, something that we can relate to, isn't it? And, you know, the artist is often, well, the artist is taking materials that the artist didn't generate him or herself, right? Wood, fabrics, metals, and those are coming from nature, uh, transformed by, by human activity. And they're also using images, shapes, motifs coming to some degree from nature, whether they be crystalline, whether they be plant-like, whether they be animal, whether they be human. But the artist goes beyond that, as we've, we've seen, right? Making this, this objective. He says, it's no longer that. Now it's the satisfied night of substance, which has its pathos within it and is not in need of anything because it returns from intuition, an shaoang, right? Um, from the objectivity that has been superseded. Objectivity is gegenständlichkeit, superseded is aufgehoben. So there has been a transformation taking place here, a dialectical transformation that, that we have you know, charted out. And the individual worshiper who is this site, this habitation where the God is engaging with them, has returned uh, their, you know, the, um, the individuality that they have is not that of the artist. They are able to enjoy. They are able to go beyond the mere objectivity, the gegenständlichkeit of, say, the idol or the rituals or whatever it else that they are involved with. Um, now, Hegel uses this term pathos and doesn't really explain what he means by it or why he's using that. And we should probably pause on that a bit after we look at the next thing where he brings up pathos, right? He says, this pathos is by itself the being of the risen sun, but a being which is now set within itself and has its setting or going down, that is self-consciousness, hence existence and actuality within itself. And so we might be tempted to read pathos in a couple different ways, which I don't want to suggest are completely wrong, but we might say, oh, okay, so pathos here means something like deep and paradoxical, right? It's both the rising sun and the setting sun and both at the same time. And, ooh, that sounds cool. What a cool image, right? Um, in a way, you could say with any given sunrise or sunset, if, all you, if, you, if you have no context, you actually don't know whether it is a rising sun or setting sun. Like if you don't know whether it's the east or the west and you just see a, a glowing ball of fire and some clouds, is it the rising or setting sun? You don't know, right? And, and so maybe there's something that could be developed there out of that. So is, is that a, a wrong way of looking at pathos? I don't know. Uh, maybe we should also look at pathos as sort of a code word for containing something uh, clearly dialectical, something that um, is dialectical in the sense of the concept, in the developed sense, meaning <clears throat> where we ourselves, the thinker, not, we're not just using representation, but we're actually grasping the uh, object in its totality, uh, going beyond objectivity, right? So, you know, we've got a lot of stuff here, right? Self-consciousness, hence existence and actuality within itself. But I think we should actually think about a different sense of pathos that might be a little bit more applicable here. Going back to an earlier meaning of it. So a pathos in Greek, traditional um, philosophical Greek, going back to antiquity, means something that we suffer, something that is done or happens to us rather than something that we ourselves are the self-conscious agent of, even within ourselves. So, you know, the pathé are the emotions, as we call them. There are also other affects and things that, you know, we undergo. It becomes one of the categories of Aristotle, you know, um, there's, you know, uh, acting and being acted upon or suffering, right? Um, so I think that's part of what's happening here. Because if we look 
later on in the paragraph, what we have is the God, identified as the essence, the vasen, making of itself something objective, something that is then available to the individual to consume. It makes itself passive, you could say. So let's, let's continue on. So the pathos is by itself the being of the risen sun, but a being which is now set within itself and has its setting or going down, that is self-consciousness. That is its going down, right? And hence existence and actuality within itself. It is here traversed the movement of its actualization. This is becoming actual, becoming real, becoming vehiclic. Now, He goes on and he says, coming down from its pure essential nature and becoming an objective force of nature and the expressions of that force. Um, This is a very interesting way to talk. So we're talking about the God doing this within the scope of the cult, but also within the scope of what the cult focuses our attention on, but but is not the cult itself, namely the, the reality of the natural world and the world that can be harvested, right, as the, the natural world. Um, Hegel doesn't actually use nature twice here in the German. So coming down from its pure essentiality, right, is a better way to frame it. And then becoming an objective, gegenständliche, force of nature, Naturkraft. And what are, what are forces of nature? When we hear that phrase, we typically think of like, oh, thunder, lightning, wind, you know, volcanoes. Okay, but that, sure, yeah. He doesn't mention any of that here, though. What is he actually going to mention? The fruits of harvesting, gathering, agriculture, all these things that we're going to talk about a little bit more. And he says um, it's not just an objective force of nature. It's also the expressions of that force. And it becomes an outer existence, a Dasein for the other, the self by which it is consumed. That's the individual worshiper who is consuming within the cult, but is also consuming outside of the cult, is consuming pretty much just to stay afloat, stay alive, right? And he he goes on, he says, the silent essence of selfless nature in its fruits attains to that stage where self-prepared and digested, It offers itself to life that has a self-like nature. Okay, so what are we talking about here? I thought we had this achievement. You know, just look at the last paragraph. The God has to have a self, right? If it's the God of the ethical nation, the God of the uh, work of art. Yes, yes. So that's correct. Hegel is talking about here what it is that nature itself does, which then can become a kind of sight, a vehicle for the God. So think of, for example, um, berries. Whatever berries you happen to eat in wherever you happen to live, um, there are many different kinds of wonderful fruits, you know, that we call berries across the world. Some of them are not actually berries. Apparently, like strawberries are a conglomerate of things. So, you know, think about like raspberries or blueberries or huckleberries or, you know, uh, gooseberries or whatever it is that you happen to have. So Hegel says the silent essence of selfless nature, right? Nature does what it does without having a conscious let alone self-conscious self. It follows certain you know, uh, procedures, certain processes, certain things that are just built in. In its fruits, attains to, its, to that stage where self-prepared, right? It, it, it does prepare itself. Um, you know, you look at the pollination and then the germination, you know, and, and the turning into this fruity thing that is going to have seeds within it that will get, you know, uh, that's the process of reproduction. They're going to get eaten and then they're going to get, you know, left somewhere and then you're going to get new plants. This whole process of self-preparing, and we could say digestion is happening. We think of that as what's happening in our bellies, but it's actually happening, you know, in, in the ripening. So you say, we say it, it offers itself to life that has a self-like nature. Now that's an interesting turn of phrase too, that has a self-like nature. So that's definitely us. 
Does that include the other animals? I'll just leave that, that thought out there, right? Um, now, he says, in its usefulness as food and drink, it reaches its highest perfection. So, cereals, pulses, you know, whatever else we're going we're gonna to eat, whatever we can turn into food and drink, that is the highest perfection, the highest fulfillment of nature. Not to say that everything else isn't important, but that's where it really becomes what it ought to be. And he says, in this is the possibility of a higher existence and comes into contact with spiritual reality. So, you know, like the berries that I'm shoving into my face and chewing on because I'm a human being uh, and enjoying them, those berries are in a certain way brought to a higher state of existence by being incorporated into me. Somebody who can read Hegel and talk about it or think about the history or dialectic or any of these cool sorts of things. And now he's got this weird, you know, bring, bringing it to an end. In its metamorphosis, the earth spirit has developed partly into a silently energizing substance, partly into a spiritual fermentation. So uh, silently energizing substance is the female principle of nourishment. Why should nourishment be female? I, you know, I, I don't really know. Um, you know, these, these sorts of things remind me of the section much earlier on in the reason uh, portion of the work where he's like looking at, you know, acid and base and positive and negative. And a lot of these things are kind of arbitrary. We could shift them back and forth. But in any case, he says uh, the, the um, masculine principle is the self-impelling force of self-conscious existence which is the spiritual fermentation. And now we need to see where this is actually going. He's going to bring up um, you know, male and female again uh, in just a few paragraphs. Um, but I don't, I don't know that that really adds that much. But what we do have is the God relating itself to us, the worshipers, as something to be consumed and thereby by us to be transformed into something higher.